talk to you today about uh, scaling uh, computation uh, to keep uh, pace with the data generation of the system that this task to uh, talk about. And uh, I thought I would just um, begin by talking a little bit about um, the scaling of uh, data generation in uh, sequencing and genomics, uh, which is really advised biology. This curve I'll show sure you all see. It's from the uh, NHGRI website. And it shows the scaling in uh, sequencing data generation, which as you all know has been amazing and that's one of the things about DNA sequencing which is scaling. So until about 2007 or 2008, this was of course uh, scaling exponentially. This is a straight line on log plot which shows exponential scaling. And it's following the exponential scaling that we've traditionally seen in the computer industry related to we first got this amazing uh, advent of next-gen sequencing where we got this exponential scaling. Sequencing became much cheaper and cheaper. And then notice, though, that subsequently, we look like we kind of resumed to some degree paralleling that um, or a line. And so people have spent a lot of time talking about, you know, is the scaling exponential or is it not? How do we think about the scaling in the future? Um, I'd like to posit that the scaling in um, DNA generation actually follows what we said. It doesn't follow Moore's law. It follows this thing called Kreider's law. So what is Kreider's law? Well, uh, Kreider was the uh, vice president of Seagate, uh, and he came up with the scaling law, very like Bernard's like Moore's law, to describe the way uh, this drives get bigger and bigger, and we can store more for information. And it's an exponential scaling instead of just like Moore's law. kind of S-curve like uh, phenomena. And I think that this um, Kreider's law, Moore's law phenomena, obviously governs much of what we see in the um, computer world. And it, I believe it also governs what we see to some degree in the sequencing world. So then the question is, how do these two scaling behaviors come together? And this schematic kind of shows kind of how to think about it a little bit. So bef you know, let's look at the cost in a kind of sequencing experiment you know, around 2000 when the human genome is done. Well, this uh, sort of schematic shows that most of the cost obviously went into the sequencing itself, okay? It's very much like when they first start taking pictures, most of the money went into actually the dogger type, making the photograph. And a little bit went into the sample acquisition and a little bit went into the downstream analysis. Of course, what we've seen with next-gen sequencing is that, that this blue part has shrunk and of course now we have much more of the cost going into the downstream analysis or the sample acquisition. And what we expect to see in the future is as the exponential scaling of sequencing technology continues, we expect that essentially the cost of the sequencing itself to go nearly to zero. And when that happens, of course, proportionally most of the cost in one of these experiments is going to be taken up by downstream analysis or sample acquisition. It's very much like in photography where nowadays it costs nothing to take a picture. You can just do that on your iPhone. So what the big thing about photography now is the, you know, picking the subject, doing interesting things with the photographs. Now I've split, up, I've split up the downstream analysis into what I call pipeline processing, which is storing the data and say mapping it and doing standard pipeline operations versus kind of more open-ended downstream analysis. And the pipeline analysis actually scales very well with the kind of Moore's law increase in disk speeds, processor speeds, and so forth. So actually proportionally, you don't expect to see it go up that much. And actually one thing that's really neat to see is there's been a kind of a parallel Moore's law uh, development in the mapping algorithms that people use, for instance, in bioinformatics, where, for instance, this picture shows the speed of all these algorithms published on a log graph, and you can see the early algorithms, for instance, that use dynamic programming up here, the next-gen algorithms such as BLAST that use hashing, and then the modern algorithms such as MAC or BWA that use sophisticated things like the borrows wheeler transform, and you can see, again, a very nice uh, exponential scaling. Of course, the thing that's not exponentially scaling 
is this big yellow bubble, which is the downstream analysis, which is completely open-ended. And the reality is it's very important, but we just don't know how to scale it. And because of that, what do we do? Well, we have to hire people, and we have to have human brains involved, and we can't, you know, can't scale that exponentially. And so this, of course, is what that means. This is you know, lots of faculty positions and research positions for people in bioinformatics, which, of course, is very pleasant for me to see um, many years after, uh, after living through this, this world. <laughs> um, another thing that the uh, exponential scaling of data generation leads to, of course, is a huge uh, increase in the size of what we're storing in the database. This is a plot you've probably all seen where we have the number of petabases stored in one of the uh, public repositories, the sequence read repository. Now, what's, what I'm particularly interested in is we're piling up all these bases. But what's kind of interesting to think about is how the, the ideas are diffusing through the community, how they're moving through the community, how that's scaling, how the, our real intellectual output is scaling. And one way of looking at that is to look at the papers people are publishing in relation to sequencing and look at what subject those papers are in. And so I'll, show, I'll describe a little analysis we do, which is kind of interesting. So this picture shows um, the number of bases associated with publications in different journals. The different lines are different journals, and this line over here, this is nature. So this is the huge amount of data that's associated with nature. Nature has traditionally dominated uh, genomics. These lines show, for instance, science, cell, uh, another, another, other prominent journals, genome biology. But what's really interesting is to look at this down here. These are journals such as nature chemical biology, um, molecular ecology. We see sequencing technology and sequencing ideas diffusing into these journals. And very quickly, I've looked at this idea of kind of diffusion of sequencing ideas in a number of contexts. One way of looking at it is looking at what we see happening with various genomics data sets. I've been very involved with this particular data set associated with the ENCODE consortium, where they've diagrammed the publications in the consortium in blue over time versus those that use the data in red. Obviously, the people using the data rapidly increasing after the data was produced. But what's interesting is because these are publications associated with people, we can actually build the social network of how they're used. And this shows the social network as of 2014 of people using this data. And what you can see when you look at each person in the network, you can see they break into different groups. There's people in the consortium, shown in yellow, that have high connectivity in the consortium. There's people outside that have high connectivity outside. And then there's a few people that have high connectivity both inside and outside the consortium. And we call these brokers. This is this kind of second circle here in this network. And these people are really key in terms of the scaling and diffusion of this information outside the little uh, generating group. And what's really neat, of course, is not only can we look at this network, we can actually watch this inner group develop over time from 2004 to 2013. You, it's almost like a planetary system you see developing, and you can see this diffusion process actually happening. Okay, so I'd like to uh, just conclude. So I've talked to you about essentially two uh, bits of work that have been done in my lab over the years. One was this by Paul Muir, who's a graduate student, actually with me and Farron. Uh, and also uh, Joel Rosowski, an associate research scientist. They worked a lot on the scaling behavior. And Dai Feng Wang, an associate research scientist who's moved on to um, a faculty position, worked on the um, ENCODE analysis. And the quick things I've talked to you about is the exponential falling of sequence costs. I think the key thing is to keep in mind this Crider's law idea in addition to Moore's law. Uh, and how uh, we see with that, of course, the Moore's law increase in computing, and because of that, a fairly constant use of kind of pipeline processing, but this vast expansion of downstream analysis. Um, and then I think a very key thing we also see is this idea of kind of how the knowledge actually scales and diffuses out of genomics and the sequencing world into other fields, and I think that's a particularly interesting thing to see. And here I've kind of shown you how, to some degree, you can see it mediated by key connector or broker individuals. And thank you for your attention. Is that published somewhere? Yes, yeah. yes. No, that's in that second thing, in oh, that TIG okay. paper. And you can actually, um, well, you know, one thing that's nice about this stuff is that you can 
download those um, networks and whatnot if you want to see further diffusion or see see if your friends on the network and so forth. <laughs> So a related question on the sort of dynamics of science, does, does that lend any ideas to you about how we can improve dissemination of information and collaborative nature of, um, of science? Well, I think, I think what, one of the things I was pushing here is I think it's all great when our data generation is going up exponentially, our computing is, but I think the key thing really in terms of getting ideas out is this diffusion process. And the diffusion process is fun, fundamentally mediated by people. And I do think that the what I was trying to highlight was these connector individuals and really thinking about how to select those. And, and you know, ideas really are transmitted by other people. That's the fundamental thing. And you know, how do you get those connector people and to spread your ideas and so forth? 